Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We're extremely happy to have you here. Uh, we're <laughs> here for Connectio pre-tender information gathering sessions for phase one. So I wanted to, to welcome, every, uh, welcome everybody um, and introduce myself. First of all, my name is Rhonda Singus. I'm a management consultant in the uh, digital city and uh, connected communities uh, section within the technology services division. And it's my pleasure to work uh, alongside some of the colleagues here today on the Connectio initiative, which we're all very excited about, uh, as well as to uh, be hearing from you uh, as interested in parties. So um, uh, I will be um, moderating this evening and really helping out in terms of uh, looking at your questions and answers that we'll talk to you about in a minute uh, that will be in the chat. So um, if I can have the first slide up, uh, please, uh, Alice. Before we introduce the panel, uh, we'll look at a few, uh, I'll say, housekeeping items. Because we are in a virtual environment, um, as many appreciate that because of COVID-19, we've been doing this now for uh, just about 14 months or so. So if you haven't had the opportunity to participate in a public uh, meeting uh, that's virtual before, uh, we'll just go over a few things for, for your awareness. So. Um, First of all, because this is virtual, there's two ways that you can participate uh, in terms of um, having your say. Uh, you'll notice in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a chat feature that's there. So when you enter things into the chat, all of the attendees and panelists can see your um, comments and or questions. So that's one way uh, you can um, raise a question for a panel member. I'll be looking at that and we will. I will be asking questions that appear there for the uh, thank you, digital feedback, good evening. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be sharing those with the panel by reading those questions out. If you chat with one another, I won't be re reading out those back and forth, but please feel free. Uh, this is uh, a forum for you as well. So f feel free to do that if you want. Staff will take a look at those afterwards if there's comments related to what we're discussing here. The other way that you can um, participate uh, is to raise your virtual hand. So in the participants list, you'll see, you'll only see yourself and panel members, and that is for privacy reasons. So uh, you, you don't see all attendees and only um, panelists have their cameras on and are unmuted. So if you want to raise your virtual hand, uh, one of the moderators will uh, call on you and unmute you so that you can um, do your, um, uh, ask, ask your question. And then we ask you to lower your hand, uh, your virtual hand, uh, after you have asked your question and it's been answered. Okay, so we'll, we will go through that a few times uh, as, as things um, move forward. So, uh, we will, um, we want to be respectful of the environment that we're in. It is, as I said, it's virtual. It's not something we're all extremely comfortable with, even though we've, we may have been doing it before. But very similar to in a public meeting um, that would be in person, we, we want you to be engaged and be personable. And remember, everyone has a voice. So one voice at a time, please be direct. And if you can, frame your question around the specific topic that's being dealt with, or if you want to address it to a particular panelist, that's fine too. Um, we'll ask that you want to be brief and limit yourself to one question or comment at a time. There will be other opportunities to engage. Be a good listener, keep an open mind, and remember that we're in a respectful environment that is um, inclusive. So please, um, you know, we, we please be careful how you how you uh, phrase things, uh, or be respectful to one another. Is the best way I can put that. Um, the there will be an opportunity as well if we don't get to your uh, questions this evening because there's a, a lot of them. Uh, everyone here will have an opportunity to participate uh, online. There will be a questionnaire that's available um, starting tomorrow that will be open for two weeks. So we, we are welcoming uh, different ways on, on gathering your feedback. Uh, so with that being said, uh, one more thing, I just do wanna make you aware that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, and again, we will be posting the presentation uh, online for future viewing, as well as um, the presentation will be available in an accessible format as well. And in the meantime, it's my privilege to uh, introduce uh, you to our uh, esteemed panel uh, this evening. Uh, so, um, uh, as I mentioned, who I was, uh, in addition to behind the scenes moderating is uh, Hamish Goodman. He's uh, uh, also a management consultant in technology services. Um, 
But uh, our, the people who will be speaking to you this evening uh, would start off with Lawrence Etta. He's our Chief Technology Officer. Hi, Lawrence. Uh, Alice Zhu is the uh, Digital City uh, Connected Communities Manager. And uh, Michelle Anthony is uh, a um, Category Manager in our Purchasing and Management and Materials Management Division. Who will be speaking to us about that process. So now it's my privilege to uh, have um, the meeting uh, uh, opened up. Uh, I'll pass it over to um, Lawrence Etta, Chief Technology Officer. Take it away, Lawrence. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Thank you for kicking us off. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us and taking the time in your evening to be part of this process, this very important um, initiative that uh, my colleagues and I are looking to uh, move forward. So starting off, I will just uh, say a few words on the land acknowledgement. So we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendats peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, we are here to discuss the digital equity and to look to the future of the type of place we want to live. Reconciliation doesn't stop at the physical world. It extends to our digital spaces and beyond them. With that in mind, I would like to give voice to the words of Alexander Dirkskin, a member of the Métis Nation who delivered these remarks at Queen's University in November 2018. Alexander stated, there is so much wisdom in these territories and in the peoples who have been stewards of them since time immemorial. As we hold space today for dialogue on digital spaces, which so often feel ephemeral and borderless, it is critical for us to reaffirm the centrality of and our connection to these physical territories upon which we gather. Meaningful change begins with recognition of technological innovation as a fundamental human endeavor. Technology is not a neutral force, nor any digital spaces, digital spaces creating safe spaces for all. Instead, mirroring, replicating, and at times exaggerating the real and pressing realities faced by indigenous peoples and other marginalized communities in physical spaces. A social justice lens must therefore be applied to all that we discuss, design, and develop in the digital realm. Again, I would like to personally thank you all on behalf of my colleagues for attending, and we really look forward to taking this time to helping the city build a solution that makes digital equity more achievable through ConnectTO. We'll move to the next slide, please. So the purpose of our meeting today, just to provide some background and context, City of Toronto Council had requested the Chief Technology Officer and the Chief Procurement Officer to engage with the city's tech community and also potential end users and anti-poverty advocacy groups in gathering information, conducting these sessions to leverage the community expertise prior to the tender documents being finalized for ConnectTO. Our current situation shows that as part of the ConnectTO phase one, the City of Toronto will soon seek and select that third party service provider or providers in order to initiate the internet and network connectivity for those three identified sites in 2021 through the tender and procurement process. As city staff, we are now gathering information with your support and your help to inform the ConnectTO phase one procurement documents before they are finalized and issued. In the future, we will have further ConnectTO consultation opportunities to help us in 2021 and 2022 and beyond. And for example, that could entail the digital equity policy. Next slides, please. So the agenda today, 
We're going to first start on presentations by staff, which will include an overview of the Connect TO initiative, as well as the procurement process that the City of Toronto is about to embark on for phase one. There will be an opportunity for you to ask questions about the presentations before we move on to the information gathering portion of the sessions, which will be in the form of staff asking you questions. We also look forward to hearing from you as the community experts to help inform the way we will state the requirements for Connectio Phase 1 within our procurement process. So that information gathering and then next steps are very, very important um, in terms of the process. So let's hand to the next slide deck, please. Let's move. I'm now going to hand it to my colleague, Alice, um, to take us through the presentation. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Lawrence, and uh, thank you uh, again to everybody for, for being here tonight, uh, for taking time out of your your day to um, to help us um, inform this uh, this phase one approach. So um, I just wanted to let everyone know that um, at during the Q's and A's, if you want to raise your hand, if you're on the phone, I think there's two people called it calling in. Please press star three and uh, that'll show us that you are raising your hand. So I'd like to give a little bit of a background in how, um, you know, why we're here today. Um, the journey, uh, you know, has been um, really started in 2019 when uh, City Council directed us to look at creating a digital infrastructure plan. We went to the public with consultations that fall and winter, and we created these uh, working principles, including equity and inclusion as a core part of how we're building out this plan. We, we reported to council on this and they gave us the go ahead to continue with this work um, and validated and adopted those principles. Uh, 2020 was an extraordinary year and it saw us not only work, work on the, the policy side of things, but really starting to um, look at implementation of digital uh, inclusivity and equity projects such as digital canopy through a, uh, a donation, as well as other initiatives like Wi-Fi and wheels that saw us bring Wi-Fi to city parks. Um, a couple weekends last summer, we managed a, a donation um, to uh, 500 smartphones uh, through the Toronto Aboriginal Support Services Council, as well as really digging into some research into, you know, um, who's underserved and why with five different universities and colleges. So armed with that information and community feedback, we went to city council, um, in earlier this year in 2021 with our report around Connectio. How do we bring high speed internet to everyone in the city? And so we, we they approved a multi-phase program with some specific phase one deliverables, which we wanna to talk to you about today, as well as get your, uh, let you know more about the program overall. So that's what brought us here today. If, uh, when council adopted this in February, we started working on this and, um, Part of the process, of course, is hearing from the community. Um, there are a few outcomes we're looking for from the from the overall program, including digital equity, reducing internet costs, especially for those who are vulnerable and underserved, economic recovery. Uh, we're looking for long-term fiscal health uh, for the city, as well as maintaining the city's technology leadership, um, both in Canada and around the world. Um, when we looked at the program overall, we realized that there were three main areas of focus and I'll go into them um, right now. So the first thing I want to bring to your attention is that we'd like to, we're looking at how to bring connectivity um, as an outcome for the city as it conducts its business. So when we're building and um, retrofitting affordable housing, thinking about how to embed in, in connectivity as an outcome at the front, not tacking on at the end. How do we embed more Wi-Fi in public spaces? How do we deploy a dig once policy so that we can um, have an opportunity to add to our, our fiber assets as well as uh, connectivity assets throughout the city? How do we work with um, connectivity in our planning processes? Because we realized through the research and through hearing from the public, especially over the pandemic, that uh, connectivity is 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 a right for everyone that we want to make sure that everyone has the the ability to connect um, in an if, in an affordable way. 
Um, the second bucket of work I want to tell you about is the policy development, and we hope to see you more in, in future consultations on that as well. We're looking at, um, you know, how digital literacy fits into this picture, because we understand that's not simply, you know, maybe giving somebody a device or helping them get connected. It's really around all of the other things that make that connectivity valuable and meaningful. So we're also looking at um, creating a, the, the first uh, digital equity policy for Toronto, um, building on uh, various pieces of work done so far, including data for equity, et cetera. And this will fit well into our digital infrastructure plan um, work overall. And the last piece of uh, work I want to tell, tell you about is about this uh, broadband network. And I think that's why many of you are here tonight. Um, it's about how we can leverage city assets, um, you know, our buildings, our fiber assets, our agency boards and commissions, fiber assets and other uh, building assets, as well as our you know, sidewalk, our trenches, et cetera. How do we leverage that? Um, to create an opportunity to work uh, with a partner or partners to have the ultimate goal of expanding internet access for underserved Torontonians. And to give you some um, context, we are looking at, for, for this phase one deployment scope, um, we're looking at three locations that are specified in the staff report, as well as one more location likely um, that was brought to our attention through council directive at uh, through the through the council process really looking at how to provide physical network and connectivity in these areas and we'll be evaluating the outcome of these these sites based on physical connectivity based on service management as well as testing out the partnership business model we'll take this learning um, and it's it's real learning we're here to really understand how this will work in the community, how this might work for Toronto. And we'll take that along with the other research and assessment and policy development, et cetera, and bring uh, recommendations back to council later on to inform the future phases. So that's where we, we are today. We're here to, to gather your thoughts on, you know, how to make this phase one scope uh, procurement work. And from a timeline perspective, um, here we are, get, initiating the process and getting the tender documents ready. Um, after that, we'll of course do the site initiation, um, hopefully by uh, Q3 of 2021, with a target report back of the at the end of the year. Um, so and now I'll, it's my pleasure to hand it over to my colleague, Michelle, who will tell us more about the, the sourcing strategy on this. Thanks, Alice. Um, if, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, the city has introduced a strategic procurement approach in terms of how we procure and buy goods and services. Um, this helps us to uh, deliver and try to gain best value for our taxpayers and improve our supplier relationship. So this strategic sourcing procurement approach was introduced back in 2018 when the category management and strategic sourcing team was implemented. So it's, it's still fairly new, um, but we've been actively um, working um, on different procurements and we've used the NRP process on several since our introduction into um, the city. Uh, so um, this uh, negotiated NRFP solicitation um, is issued uh, to gain bids and proposals where a procurement needs to be uh, where a procurement needs to be identified and we really look uh, to suppliers to propose solutions and how we can deliver methods to arrive at a desired outcome as part of the nrp process key features and things to think um, to be aware of is that it's a non-binding proposal uh, negotiations are conducted with a top rank proponent or proponents um, and these negotiations are conducted one-on-one -on -one based on desired key focus areas that we believe need additional discussions in order to try to achieve um, a successful outcome. Um, the negotiated NRFP could be identified to, uh, with the intention for the city to award just to one entity, but if, for this particular um, procurement, um, I believe the intention is to um, consider the option of potentially awarding to multiple vendors. So that is something that we may choose to do, and we, um, whatever the outcome or the final decision is, it will be articulated in the actual NRFP document that would be issued um, in Ariba for this particular particular procurement. Uh, can you move to the next slide, Alice? Thanks. Um, in terms of negotiations, like I said, we've conducted and done this um, 
across multiple categories at the city uh, since category management and strategic sourcing has been implemented. Um, because of the current environment and climate, these negotiations, once a top rank vendor or vendors are identified, these negotiations are conducted one on one with each supplier. Uh, we really strive to address any key areas that we believe need additional clarity, um, additional discussions. Um, it's an opportunity for the city as well as the vendor to um, request supplementary information um, so that we it, it will help inform the actual contract if we're able to successfully arrive at one. You know, there are several key areas that we often touch on as we go through negotiations with any IT vendor. Uh, so we will often discuss statement of work, so the scope of the services, service level agreements and different targets and measures we like to see in terms of performance, um, as well as pricing. Pricing is often um, one of the, the key things we look for, but there are also, also, there are also important things from a technology and security standpoint that we, we discuss at the negotiation table. So it could be things around privacy, you know, how data is stored, where it's stored, et cetera. Um, we have these conversations and the intention is obviously to arrive to a successful outcome, but if for some reason, um, we are not able to arrive at a desired outcome successfully with the vendor or vendors. Uh, the city may choose to discontinue negotiations um, and move on to the next uh, best rank supplier um, to conduct negotiations with that vendor or vendors. Uh, next slide, Alice. This slide really just depicts the very traditional and standard um, NRFP lifecycle process flow. So as Alice mentioned, um, you know, a key step here will be the actual development of the NRFP document. So all of the particulars that the city is looking for, requirements, the evaluation criteria, the evaluation stages, et cetera. Once that document has been finalized and reviewed and approved for publishing, we will submit, um, we will upload and issue the call in Ariba and then all vendors who um, have, have um, registered in Ariba and are under the technology commodity code will receive this particular tender and they'll have visibility to it. And they have um, the opportunity to submit their bids and their proposals in Ariba. Once those bids are submitted, uh, the PMMB team will go through the evaluation process and that evaluation process will be defined in detail in the actual NRFP document. And there are often multiple stages identified that we, we follow and we evaluate each supplier that makes it to this stage. Um, um, we, we evaluate each supplier's proposal um, across the evaluation stages and criteria that we've identified. Once we've ranked the vendors and we've identified top ranked suppliers, um, we will move forward to the negotiation stage, uh, conduct negotiations. Hopefully we have a successful outcome. And then we will move to actually preparing a report to actually award, um, to get approval to award the contract. Um, once we get approval to award, um, we then advise the vendor and then we work towards executing the actual agreement uh, to get the contract in place. Uh, this slide just provides a little bit more of a deeper level in terms of the details of the evaluation stages. This is not um, a standard approach for every single call. Each call could, could look slightly different. Um, it all depends on what we decide and we, we lay out and state in the actual NRFP document. But traditionally, um, the evaluation process will have sub several stages. The first stage is, is traditionally um, review of the mandatory submission requirements. So these are anything that the city deems as absolutely non-negotiable. There are things that are essential for us to be able to, to work with a particular supplier or suppliers. Uh, once we conduct that mandatory submission evaluation, all the vendors who are compliant will move to the subsequent stage, which is often a technical functional evaluation of different requirements. Then we subsequently will move down to pricing. And then once we've ranked the suppliers, we will move into the negotiation phase. Um, once negotiations conclude, we will look to award um, and, and the contract, get approval to award the contract to either one vendor or, or multiple vendors. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, uh, Alice, uh, and Michelle. We appreciate the overview of Connectio as well as the procurement process. At this point, we wanted to um, uh, allow for a little pause for uh, folks to uh, ask questions if they have any based on the presentation. So again, just a reminder, there's several ways you can do that by uh, typing something into the chat. If you're online, uh, feel free to do that now. Uh, or if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, 
uh, virtual, you raise your virtual hand, please, if you're online, you'll see a, literally a little hand uh, in the participant window. And if you are on the phone and you would like to raise your virtual hand, uh, just a reminder, it's star three to raise your hand. So I'll just pause for a moment. So far, nothing in the chat. Here we go. So thank you. It says, uh, the question is, what specific steps will the city be taking in the near future to know how to organize and mobilize as a community to make publicly funded affordable internet happen? So, um, Alejandro, thank you for the question. It's nice to see you here tonight. Um, hope you're well. So, I think the, the question is, what steps will we take to, to have a publicly funded affordable internet? What we're um, trying to achieve today, which is the, the uh, council direction given to us, is to work with um, a partner. So we would, the city will be um, setting out the goals and the mandate of the program. The city will be directing, um, give, you know, after taking in public feedback, because of course we are public servants, we work for the public. We would then direct um, the, the, the direction of the, the program overall, but we will not be actually delivering internet to home to the, uh, to, to the um, businesses and, and, and members of the public. So the idea here is we will work in partnership, we will develop the, the way that this will be done, the city will give input, the city's input is our assets, et cetera, and then the, uh, the partner will be actually doing the um, internet uh, to home. I hope that answers your question. There is uh, two people uh, with their hands raised. The first person that raised their hand was a call-in user with the number 416. Uh, is that Direction me? 41666. Yep, there you go. You can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Sure. Um, my question is about the timelines. When, by what point do you expect to have awarded the contract? Um, it's, I ask because it seems that the timelines are very short, like you would, I understand the city is going to bring fiber to certain buildings. So the contract has to get awarded, the fiber has to get connected, then the, the company that you've uh, chosen has to connect everybody. And then you want to be reporting to city council before end of year. So, so what are the timelines? Um, so, thank you for the question. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer that question. So, um, it depends on negotiations largely, as you as you just heard, <laughs> that's something that we, we have some control over, but it largely, you know, we, we, we don't have complete control over based on who is, um, hand, uh, who, who submits a proposal. Um, the idea is that for this phase one of the, um, of the program, we will not be able to do any of the large scale fiber deployment that that will be for the larger uh, pro phase. So for phase one, it's quite a contained uh, exercise to learn uh, and have, you know, to, ha as a learning experience. So um, the, the way that we'll be starting that learning is to to um, to bring a partner in, start to see how that um, the connectivity program will work and, and start testing different models with, with that. So to answer your question, I agree with you. It would not, there's no uh, real opportunity to have, a, you know, a large scale construction. Um, it's not, it's, it's, that's the ultimate goal of the program overall, but it, it will not be a full scale uh, construction for the, for phase one. Thanks, Alice. Um, there's another, another, uh, attendee with their their hand up um, this is acorn uh with the with the identifier acorn so i'll just uh there you go you can go ahead and ask your question please oh thank you um just like to say um this is a uh, ria rini uh co-chair of the uh, topico chapter of toronto acorn um, thank you so much for having us tonight and also thank you very much to connectio 
Uh, and Alice, um, you guys are wonderful for creating this program. Uh, Acorn has been fighting for so long for affordable internet. Um, and we're so pleased when it comes to this. Um, and we just have quick questions about where the city stands um, when it comes to some of our key demands um, for, for this um, uh, municipally run internet program. Um, the first one, and probably the key one being, um, where do you guys stand or where does the city stand in general on having a publicly owned and controlled ISP? It, it would be great to have a city owned ISP, but we know sometimes that's not feasible, but we're just wondering where you guys stand on the possibility of public ownership and public control over the ISP that delivers the program uh, versus say having one of the big uh, companies like Rogers, Bell or TELUS uh, own and control the ISP that will be used. Um, <laughs> sorry, Lawrence, I don't know if you want to start or did you want um, me to start? You start, Alice. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> It's nice to see you here tonight. Uh, thanks for, for for joining and for the question. Um, so I think I think the difference between I, I mean thank you and also highlighting the the demands that Aircorn has had. I've, I've um, I'm, I'm familiar with them and and appreciate the efforts you put in to organize that. The the way that we are envisioning this this partnership is the city will be in control of the outcomes of the partnership, if that makes sense. The city is in charge of the direction, the city is setting the mandate, um, and, and et cetera. The, uh, I guess what the difference between the program we're envisioning where we've been given council directive to explore versus a publicly owned ISP is that it's not solely the city that's delivering the service, right? We are bringing in partner or partners uh, to be able to do that. Um, there was a question earlier about whether or not it's expected to be profitable for the private partner. We are open to any partners to submit a, a proposal. We we don't know if it's going to be for profit or not for profit. That is not, uh, we, we're not putting any requirements around that. But uh, maybe Lawrence, you can, you can add to that. Yeah, and, and thank you for the question. Um, I think the, the Connect TO program, just to separate in terms of the program and the intent of the program, will still be led and, and focused by the City of Toronto. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, an ISP, our, our focus is really, you know, ensuring that we can utilize the, the, the city's assets and the city's position from an access and affordability. So that's where our focus has been in terms of really trying to ensure that we can drive down that affordability and concentrate where investment is focused by the industry into areas that are underserved um, in that respect. But the Connect to your program and how we you know, that program will continue to be led and to be run by the City of Toronto staff. Um, so just wanted to build upon that. Thank you, Lawrence and Alice. We have one uh, other uh, thought in the uh, chat. So Susan Thien uh, asked a question. Uh, I'd like to know, will it be high speed internet? Because after we've signed up for the internet, it can be very slow. Yes, the goal is for high speed internet and there's a question later on about that. Hope to hear your thoughts then as well. I think we've got uh, time for one more question, uh, but before I go to that, I just want to remind everybody who has their hands raised or their virtual hands raised. If you have asked your question, if you can please lower it. And if you're on the phone and wondering how to lower your hand, you press star three again. Uh, so the next person with their hand raised is Sharon. Where did you go? Sharon, did you? Nope, you've lowered your hand. Okay, oh, wait. <laughs> Sharon, over to you. You've got the microphone. <laughs> uh, yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, sweet. Uh, hi, Alice. Hi, Hamish. Thank you so much for arranging this. Um, I do see like we have a bunch of ACORN members on the line. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, and I do see like we do have uh, some questions in the chat from some ACORN members. So I was wondering if you guys, it would be great if you guys could reach to those as well. Uh, but yeah, like my question was basically um, like I had, like I know we asked the same question, you know, on public control 
um because i think that's um like uh, all of our ACO members kind of have always wish for something that uh, has a community representation and you know not being controlled by like private big telecoms because we've seen how it kind of like ends up being um so kind of yeah like it would be great if connectio has that public control and community representation and also affordability i think our members have been aiming for a ten dollar internet for low and moderate income people that's um, accessible for everybody because it is essential uh, right now for a lot of people so uh do you guys have any idea on um the pricing that you guys might be thinking of Um, Sharon, um, nice to see you. Um, the, in terms of pricing, it's part of the negotiation um, with the possible partner. So we don't have any any specifics at this time. What I can say is the the goal is for the whole point of driving the program is for affordability. And there will be some questions later on. Um, I won't uh, no more spoilers, but you know, there'll be some questions later on about um, how how you'd be funded and how how it would be paid for. So. Um, happy to have more discussion that time. Okay, and perhaps we can just wrap this up. There's a couple more things in the chat uh, that I believe we'll, we will likely be discussing uh, in a little bit as well. Uh, one of them is that, um, which Alejandro asked, with access to internet, there will be a need for digital literacy and access to digital devices. How can we make it accessible? And Kim uh, from Scarborough and Acorn is um, asking whether we're gonna work with small ISP providers or only with large corporations. No, oh, I think somebody answered that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry, Alejandro yeah. uh, asked the question again. So I think I think we're. Why don't we go, go to the question and answer? I think both of those questions are covered. <laughs> if I can, yeah. um, maybe I will. Um, it's a good time to segue into the information gathering section. And um, I'd like to just quickly let you know that we'll be asking um, five sort of um, guided questions with a poll and three more open questions. But as you can see here, there's questions here about um, eligibility um, model that's appropriate for pricing and billing. So I think a lot of these questions will be answered. Uh, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to discuss them, I should say. Um, the three op more open questions, we'll have a little more time for that. And so they are more about your expectations as a potential end user, expectations as um, a tech community member, and any other feedback you can give us on the model. So um, I can um, maybe, I wanted to also let everybody know that even though we're, we're going through this pretty quickly and getting everyone's feedback right now, we highly encourage you to go to our website and answer the survey at your own time. It'll be up starting tomorrow and it'll be up for two weeks until June 4th. So there it is <laughs> right on cue. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, the link to our web page is there and we'll have a survey there. You can give us more thoughts. You can um, give us more information and also give us input into these questions again. So looking forward to that as well. Um, great. So the first question um, is about, you know, entities to deliver this model. This has come up already. Um, we just want to re reiterate that we are not positioning the city as an ISP at this time. That's the, that's not the council direction we've been given, but we are looking to drive um, filling gaps of, of affordable high-speed internet in underserved areas. That is absolutely our goal. So um, well, I wonder if we can start the, the polling, if it's open already. So um, we'll have a, a, a few moments for, for folks to, to click on the, the, the poll. Um, and Alice, if you for want this to- one, We have a minute and a half. So um, perhaps we can read um, the, the items out loud. There are some folks on the phone. You won't be able to vote uh, on the poll, but you could hear them. Right. Do you want me to do that or would you like to? Sure, go ahead, Rhonda. Okay, the first item uh, in answer to the question is uh, A, knowledgeable subscribers, students, and volunteers from grassroots organizations and on the job training organizations. B is only well known and trusted internet service providers under contract through the city. C is multiple service providers based on meeting coverage needs across the city as long as they adhere to specific quality of service and privacy requirements. D, um, it's, whoops, we said D already. <laughs> e is a combination of the above. 
um, F is none of the above or something other that you can suggest. We'll let people think about that for a few seconds. Okay, great. Um, I wonder if it's uh, possible to show the results of that poll to everyone. This is, <laughs> I apologize, this is, I'm, I'm not used to using the polling function, so I'm not sure if folks can see the, the outcome yet. Um, and so one of the questions was um, in the chat, I, I recall, uh, was about um, is the city working with small ISP providers or only art, large corporations exclusively? And so I hope you can see from the question that we're open to all of those options. Um, in a previous session earlier today, um, someone asked if uh, joint ventures or um, groups of people can also submit the application, uh, submit a, a proposal. So at this time, we're open to, to all sorts of different solutions that can help us solve this issue together. So um, the, the, it seems to be the highest here is um, uh, multiple service providers based, based on meeting coverage at 18% um, and pretty tied at combination of these as well as knowledgeable um, subscribers, students, volunteers from grassroots organizations. So thank you for that, um, for that answer. Um, if there's anyone who um, put in um, uh, other, I don't know if anyone wants to either put their hand up or put it in the chat so that we can um, have a fulsome understanding of this item. Nobody answered other, um, um, I don't think, uh, from, from the poll results, Alice. That is true. <laughs> Nobody, that's <laughs> funny, you know? <laughs> that's right. Um, but lots of no answers. So um, maybe, yeah, but I'm still open for any other, any other thoughts. I just pause for another moment. Mm -hmm. It's the, our first poll, so I'm going to give us a little bit of time. Yeah. So call in user with the identity 1416665 has their hand up. Oh, um, just bear with me one moment. Hey, two of the questions were identical, A and D. So you should add the results from those two. Yep, that is true. Um, Thank you. We will do apologies that. on that. Yeah, no, it wasn't a trick question. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't one of those things where are you paying attention? No, you're right. So that that actually brings it to 24%. Uh, so almost a quarter of you have answered. Um, you know your preference for knowledgeable subscribers, uh, students, volunteers from grassroots organizations. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Somebody's paying attention. That's good. <laughs> Please keep those coming. <laughs> So, Alice, I think we've got time for one more question and then we need to move on. So, the next uh, person with their hand up is, is Sharon. So, uh, Sharon, over to you. Do, do you have a question um, to ask? Oh, uh, no, I think uh, it was from before, but I can just repeat oh. one of the questions uh, from the chat that one of our members just wanted to ask. Uh, I think it was Rama Fayez. It was uh, Toronto Community Housing in partnership with Rogers offer $10 internet for its tenants. Of course, it is very slow internet, but better, better than nothing. So can the city offer such a service to all people under the poverty line with a better speed, also offering a cheap computer or tablet? because I do know a lot of our members are also looking for devices from the city. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and so that's something we definitely are thinking about. A lot of the wraparound services we're thinking about um, and Again, that depends on negotiations with the solicitation that we're about to put out, right? Um, we don't, I don't know exactly what the, the, the cost is going to be. 
there's a question coming up about the the model for um, how to pay for this and who should pay for how, what, right? Um, in terms of the devices, there are you know as you know we've been trying to do our best with through donations and through other avenues, um, but that's definitely an area that we are very interested in uh, in um, doing better in uh, in terms of devices. One of the things that's been really um, heartening for us is. Um, you know, we're, we're able to um, bring some devices through a donation um, uh, to five, 500 smartphones. We're able to go to families and people in need through the Toronto Aboriginal Support Services Council. But, you know, 500 is, is not enough, obviously. So we're definitely looking into how to, how to facilitate that better. I'm just going to pause I, there. Oh, sorry. Rhonda. No, go ahead. I, I was just going to let let you know um, the that the time is up for that question, and if if there's time afterwards at the end, we can circle back to it. But uh, just in the interest of keeping it moving, thank you. Great. Um, so, question uh, the que the second question we'd like to to talk about now is you know which models are appropriate to fund uh, this network. As you know, as you may know, <laughs> uh, we don't have any approved capital or operating budget allocated right now to implement and operate the the broadband network our approach is to um, offer city assets as well as um, agency boards and commission assets through agreements uh, into this into this partnership so that you know the community get can get the benefit from those assets through that partnership so innovative and sustainable funding models will be required for us to ensure uh, fairness of providers uh, for that affordable reliable service there are a few options here as well. Maybe we can start this new poll. And please let me know if any of them are uh, duplicated. <laughs> I'm double checking. I don't think I see any right now. Um, we've got another minute and a half on, the, on there and I'll read them out for those who are um, listening in. Um, we are asking you to consider, you know, all subscribers, um, um, you know, fund this equally subsidies between subscribers of different means, sponsorship from businesses, donations from individuals for businesses, advertising placement on services, um, grants for investments from other levels of government, a combination of these, or none of these, uh, or something else. Just about 20 seconds left for that uh, for that poll, and then we will close that and have a, a small discussion, just like last the last question. Okay, great. So um, in a moment, we'll see the results. Um, of of that um, of that particular poll, but maybe it's if you have uh, uh, some feedback on this question, um, please uh, raise your hand or put into the chat. So we can see that um, forty one percent of you um, overwhelmingly have said uh, a combination of of the different options. Uh, of the specific options, the top one is uh, subsidies between um, subscribers of different means, um, grants or investments from other levels of government is also uh, quite a popular one at 19%. Um, all subscribers equally is at 13%. Um, and there are others who there are th this time I've noticed that there, people have said other and they may or they may have elaborated. And uh, if, if it's, that's you, please go ahead and, and let us know about that if you wish publicly. Um, otherwise, we can see the poll um, and, and still record your input. So we have um, Rama with their hand raised. Um, so Rama, if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question, please. Uh, do you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. So. 
Uh, I want to ask a question about free public Wi-Fi because many of the big cities in the world uh, offer it to their citizens. So could we have free public Wi-Fi by the city in the city-owned parks, facilities, and buildings, especially Toronto community housing? So, Rama, thank you for that question. Um, absolutely. Um, we we are working on that right now. We're actually deploying two pilot sites of Toronto community housing buildings in the next coming two weeks or so uh, with, with plans for more this year. Um, through the 2021 uh, budget, the mayor has um, made it a priority for expanding, accelerating free public Wi-Fi um, to close the digital divide. So that's, that's that's part of my team's work as well. So earlier, if you recall, we're talking about the three buckets of of work, the free public Wi-Fi and city facilities and city buildings, um, it's it's part of our work plan. So we, we are definitely doing that. Um, and if you uh, would like more information, um, please feel free to get in touch with us. We have a, an email address. You're always welcome to uh, connect with us uh, anytime. Hi, Alice. Um, um... Sorry, Barry has a, a question in the chat, um, and I'm sorry, I, I think it, his hand may have been missed earlier. So, this question is just around the sites. Why is uh, Connectio not available in Etobicoke North? Uh, he's asking if the infrastructure could run along the Finch LRT to potentially include Etobicoke North. So, um, Barry, that's a good question. Um, we did look at specifically Finch LRT uh, construction. Um, I don't want to disappoint you, but when we explore that option for the part of construction that's going on right now, they're already at a high percentage of design completion. So it was it's not appropriate for us to um, intersect with that process right now, but but certainly there are other opportunities related to that construction in um, from a you know from the city uh, perspective as well. So we we are definitely interested in pursuing options. Um, Etobicoke North is one of the sites we are looking at right now. It's not named in the in the three because we we don't know for sure exactly where we're going to land. But I can tell you um, through the discussions at council, we took it to heart that um, the mayor and and council wanted us to look at areas that are hardest hit by COVID, and certainly Etobicoke North is one of them. Um, and we we've, we've heard from the community. Um, so I see a couple of hands raised. Barry, I see yours raised now. I don't know if uh, you have anything further to add. I'll just unmute you. Um, hi, Barry, you're, you're, you've got the mic. Did you want to add anything? Okay. Um, one last chance, Barry, did you have anything further to add? Yeah, um, we we do in the Tobacco North. We desperately need uh, the internet because of uh, because of what's happening in the Tobacco North. The pandemic has really affected the Tobacco North in a big way, and our community is already is already um, not not fully have a lot of infra infrastructure. As a matter of fact, um, prior to COVID, the ACORN had a meeting up here and someone in the meeting mentioned that there was $10, uh, $10 a month internet. And we had a lot of calls and ACORN had to explain to them that they could not they could not deliver it because it's only to TCHC. So I think something should be done to make sure that they, when Connect Toronto rolls out, that uh, Etobicoke North is, is included in that. Absolutely, Barry, and um, that, that's, 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 that's our, our intention, intention to look at Etobicoke North. Um, it's also our intention through this learning process, you know, from phase one to look at the, you know, uh, many other areas of the city, not just this, but we need to have the learning now so that we can 
go back to council and ask them to approve a, a new approach. Um, the next steps, I should say. Yeah. I just want to advise everyone we've, we've hit the time limit for this question. There are still two hands raised. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it uh, to Alice to make the call. Do you want to take one more question up on this question or do you want to circle back if there's time at the end? Let's uh, let's move on to the next question. We may be able to answer them, and then uh, we definitely okay. want to circle back. And we, we yeah, we we definitely want to hear from everyone. Um, okay. So the next question is sort of around the types of services this broadband network uh, would offer to its end users. Um, and so we are. The question is around the uh, you know services that are comparable with those broadly available in the markets required. Uh, we know that we've heard from the community around that. For example, um, 50 uh, megabytes per second um, megabits per second is a minimum um, internet speed. But we would like to ask you if we can start a new poll. Um, you know what what is the what types of services would what should should we consider um dsl um fiber to home uh building and public wi-fi hotspots uh, like the way that uh, retails retailers offer in in maybe restaurants hotels or stores um a wireless solution like high speed wireless internet um a mobility offer a combination of all these another something else We have about a minute left on that poll. Um, I just want to recognize that there are some questions. There are some comments in the chat um, around um, defunding the police or taking away from the police budget. Um, I just want to let you know that it, we've noted those um, as part of the consultation. And Alejandro, I see that you said you're outdoors right now and using your cell phone gigabytes, which can can be very expensive. Um, and uh, so, yes, we are looking to um, uh, push out more pub free public Wi-Fi um, in on city facilities. We also have noted that uh, Kiri mentions that Bell and Rogers perhaps could um, uh, reallocate some of their profit to provide. Uh, better service for vulnerable people at low cost. So that's also noted. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. So um, there just be a moment before we see the results from question number three. Just a reminder: we have two more of these sort of guided questions, and then uh, more open questions uh, th at the end. Three of those questions. Um, so on this one. Um, the highest one seems to be a tie between um, building and public Wi-Fi hotspots and a combination of all of the above. Um, some other notable high scoring ones are hybrid are fiber to home. Um, and there's also some interest for um, a mobility offer as well as um, uh, DSL cable and high speed wireless wireless. So um, there are also some people who have, who chose other. I don't know if they want to uh, express those thoughts. So um, Sharon has her hand raised. Oh, uh... Sharon, did you have a question or a comment? Uh, I don't know why I keep saying my hands raised, uh, but uh, okay. yeah, no, I didn't really have any questions uh, okay. here. Um, yeah, I do know that uh, there were a few questions in the chat that kind of uh, talked about, I think uh, Ryan as well as Kiri and Alejandro, they were just mentioning if, um, you know, something on uh, like if it's uh, Connectio is something up for like big uh, privatized companies or are you guys open to um, like any other community based or nonprofit based uh, tech services or providers as well? We're absolutely open to to any um, any proposal, um, including those 
uh, that are community based. We've been looking at that ourselves as well in terms of, um, you know, what makes sense. One of the directives that we want to talk about at the end is what kind of business model. Um, it should be considered through a feasibility, desirability, and sustainability view. So, absolutely, or the, all of those models will be will be reviewed. Um, and Sharon, and to everybody, just a reminder: if you have your hand raised and you're wondering how to lower it, uh, just find your your name on the right hand bar, and uh, the hand you just press the hand button, and it'll deactivate or deselect it. Um, I think we have time for one more question for this uh, one uh, for this one. And Ike has their hand raised. Ike, you can go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Um, thank you for having this meeting. Um, yeah, I, I selected other um, only because I, I, I think maybe this has already been discussed. I uh, joined a little bit late, and I apologize for that. But um, there. There are some significant um, bringing internet to someone's building or or these wireless solutions or th the options that were prevented. There are still some barriers to actually accessing that uh, accessing that. In addition to some barriers to education, uh, for instance, providing like an open wireless solution, uh, there would have to be some education around how to you know use a public network and et cetera. Um, I, I'm curious about what uh, Connectio's role would be. Like, does it end at the point where the internet has been brought to uh, Toronto residents, or does it continue through to into the educational piece and also um, assisting with um, any sort of barriers to actually have a device to access the internet? Thank you. Um, Thank you, Aiki, for the, for the question and for your, you know, your very informed thoughts. Um, it's absolutely our intention to, um, to do the latter, I suppose, <laughs> uh, which is to provide, um, you know, um, provide the, the other means around digital literacy, digital fluency around support so that it's, it, um, so that it's not just a matter of sort of connecting somebody or giving them a device, et cetera. So, um, Part of the uh, the outcomes from the digital canopy project we've done, one of the pieces we're most proud of, in addition to providing free um, public Wi-Fi to many people in the city, is that we were able to um, uh, start a mentorship program for 15 youth uh, who live in the areas of the buildings that we that uh, have been um, that, that were selected for digital canopy, and they're going through. Um, training um, to to become um, to become educated in in network services etc so that they can bring that knowledge into the community and help the community use the the service so um, we're also you know this is coming from uh, leadership right here in the city um, Lawrence and a lot of our senior management team are mentors to the to the youth which is a event can be happening on June 16th I believe it's a 16 week program um, that's going to bring a lot of knowledge and a lot of um, um, you know support to to the youth through the um, this program as well as we want to make that an ongoing um, uh, ongoing program if we can with the you know with funding so absolutely <laughs> in other words it's our, it's our intention to look for those opportunities it's our intention to um, uh, you know um, make good on those opportunities. Thanks for that that answer, Alice. I think uh, we will now move on to the next question, please. So, question number four, um, we can start the poll. Is um, you know what models will be appropriate for end user service um, pricing and billing? Um, the things that we want to think about is you know we we're looking for that innovative and sustainable funding model um, to be able to. Um, move forward with this program. Again, the city's uh, perspective is let us use these public assets, like your assets, um, through us to be able to work with a partner to bring this uh, to bring the service to to people who need it. Um, are we thinking about um, you know actual cost less donation equally shared by all subscribers? Um, what about net cost shared according to subscribers' needs? Um, another option is fixed amount. 
with the surplus return to subscribers, like a credit union situation, or a fixed amount with a surplus reinvested into the broadband network coverage for the program overall, or another solution. So um, while that poll is uh, taking taking time, I want to recognize um, uh, Alejandro's note about access to, to high-speed, low-cost internet. Um, it also stands to close economic education divide as it creates opportunities. And so absolutely, part of the goals in the very beginning, as you may recall, is um, economic opportunities and sort of long-term, um, the long-term gains of the city that way. Okay, great. Um, and in a moment, we'll see what uh, what everybody thought of that. Um, okay, so for this question, um, twenty percent of you said actual cost, less donations, um, or the net cost shared equally by subscribers. Um, the next uh, the next selection is fixed amount with surplus funds returned. Uh, sorry, with surplus um, amounts uh, reinvested, grow the network, um, as well as other uh, some support for the other two options and some support for other. So I, I wonder if anyone wants to talk about other or give more thoughts about why they um, they support one of these uh, options. So I, I see that uh, Judy has said, depends on overall reason for enabling access. Uh, Ryan has his hand raised. So uh, Ryan, you can go ahead and ask your question or make your comment, please. Um, I was one of the people who put other just because honestly, so, a lot of those like for end user service pricing and billing, like don't really seem to take into account like we're not looking for um like it's affordable internet not to get profit so it's just i don't know a lot of these questions seem to lead towards there's going to be a private partner and if they give money they're going to want something out of it so i just i wonder where we end up just subsidizing a private company um so anyway so instead of like funding it through the cost of charging the people getting it because that's already what rogers and them do um, and we're not competing with them i just put other and said charge bell rogers for doing business in the city and take the rest from the police budget again so um i just i'm not sure how some of those options aren't just charging people for internet yeah this is all so thank I, you i hear what you're saying ryan it's um we you know the direction given to us by council is is not to create our own isp right it's to um bring the 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 outcomes we we want which is affordable high speed internet for underserved frontonians through this this partnership model so what we're trying to do is understand your um where you're coming from and to be able to inform that um you know uh, how to how to how to set up that program but your point uh, is well taken uh, Alice, there's a couple of items in the chat as well. So uh, Judy uh, mentions um, further to what she said earlier, depending on the overall reason for enabling access. Uh, she says, considering the uh, pandemic, um, the, the necessary for, I think it's communications, education, and multiple language, multi, so many things that this could be used for. Um, wondering if DSL is really the way to go. That's what I'm understanding from that. And um, is this what people pay or what what the needs um, for access can fulfill. Thank you for that, Judy. And uh, Curie says, sharing cost among subscribers shares responsibility. As more people join, costs will be reduced, sustainable service for all. Thank you for that.
Yeah, we've taken note of those those uh, points. Thank you very much. I feel like the um, the Acorn events I've been to are much more energetic, and I I feel like we <laughs> I wish we had a chant or two, but yeah, uh, <laughs> we need. <laughs> but um, and but thank you for your patience and for uh, for for contributing. I we really appreciate it, and please continue to do so. <laughs> um, Just in the interest of time, Alice, I think we need to keep moving to the next sure. one. Great. So. Um, we can always come back to more thoughts on this. Uh, number five, we can start the poll is, you know, how should eligibility for this um, be determined? So, um, you know, as you know, our goal is to reduce internet costs um, for vulnerable and underserved Torontonians through through this program um, with high speed internet. So, you know, what some things we we want you to tell us if we should consider on our system, so individuals and families who uh, who self declare uh, need um, similar to food banks, um, designated groups only. So um, you know prioritizing um, individuals, and families recognized as in need by one or more um, social uh, services entity. Um, neighborhood based, so everybody in an area, you know, a business is a neighborhood where the broadband um, network operates may receive in service. End user services. Now the funding, the the payment is the previous question, so that's a separate issue. Um, a combination of these, um, or something else. Just while we're waiting for the poll to finish, Barry, I noticed you've got your hand raised um, and that you're calling from a mobile device or, or a tablet. Uh, did you have a, a question? Uh, Barry, did you have a question? Or if you're just wondering how to lower your hand on from a mobile device, you press uh, star three. Okay, great. Um, so in a moment, we'll see um, where everybody stands on question number five. And I just want to reiterate um, that I, I hope you, you, everyone knows that we are certainly taking into consideration ACORN's demands, and that's going to be part of how we consider the larger program overall. I don't want you to think that you know the city is ignoring the you know the. Um, what you've put forward, um, but I do appreciate you uh, still taking the time to go through it, go through this process with us and giving us your thoughts because we we very much value that those uh, those considerations. Um, okay, so for, for this one, um, pretty much tied for neighborhood based and a combination of of the um, the three options, um, and then the after that, so thirty percent and twenty seven percent for those two, and then after that is you know. 10% um, for honor system and 13% uh, for designated groups, as well as um, a couple people had, well, at least one person said other. I think exactly one person said other, if my math is right. <laughs> um, so I wonder if anyone wants to expand on their thoughts on this particular topic around eligibility. Uh, call in uh, person has a question with the number 416665. You can go ahead and ask your question, please. Hey, I'm the one who answered other. My point was this. If Connectio is to become self-funding, since the city has no funding for it, and if it's to also provide below-cost service to those who need it, then it needs subscribers who can afford to pay above cost so that one subsidizes the other. So the network should welcome subscribers from all walks of life. So I, I hear you on that and we'll note that answer. Um, I just want to reiterate sort of the the basic the basis of our approach, which is that the city would put in our assets so that we can lessen the capital cost for for the end users network provider, right? So that's where we 
believe can be a win-win situation. So the city would be putting in our assets as the fiber backbone, hopefully at, at you know, the, for the bigger picture. And, um, and that's what's actually going to be offsetting costs uh, for the end user, not just other subscribers um, will be paying more to balance out the less. If you can see, um, see my hands. <laughs> that's the idea is that we would be, you know, the city will be able to enable um, um, lower prices by putting in our assets as um, as input. We have one more hand raised, um, Ike. I will unmute you in a moment, uh, but just to note, uh, uh, we've got about just under 15 minutes to go, so we're going to have to um, keep pushing this. So this will be the last question, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next slide, Alice. So Ike, you can go ahead and ask your question. Thanks again. Um, just two quick clarifying questions. Uh, the ops, the second option for designated groups. Um, uh, I'm curious of if you could talk about what one or more social services means. Does that mean that someone must be identified by uh, like a sanctioned entity, or does it, or could someone demonstrate need through some other? means that is not affiliated with any sort of governmental body. Um, that's my first question. And then for the uh, third option for neighborhood based, um, I, I'm just curious about how would, if this was an option, if this was the option chosen, how would someone uh, who doesn't live in one of these uh, designated neighborhoods uh, then get access to uh, this particular service? Thank you. So for your first question, Aiki, um, we don't have those outlined as this is just to get people talking about what what they can see as a eligibility. I, I don't know that it, we're going to go with a um, government um, defined social service entity at all, but be, the city does um, administer uh, Ontario Works and ODSP on behalf of the province. So uh, there, there have been discussions in the past that, that this is a natural place where additional um, designations and um, you know, benefits may be realized through the, the, the avenues we already have, right? The second question, um, it, it, in this case, if the Connectio program isn't in that neighborhood, unfortunately, I, I'm not, I, there's, there's no consideration right now for that, pro, for, for someone to be able to partake in the program if that, if, if it's not in one of the areas. But, but certainly I just want to reiterate, and I don't think this was your intent, but you know, that the phase one sites are, is not the entire program. This is just our learning opportunity to understand more on the community needs like today, as well as uh, the market response, et cetera. So, um, Hamish is going to give me the look, but I'm going to move on to the question number six, <laughs> um, which is more of an open question. So, you know, what are your, um, you know, expectations as a potential resident or business end user? You know, what might prompt you or motivate you to partake in this? And on the flip side, what potential reservations and challenges and barriers um, may exist for you to uh, not participate? So there's no poll. I will close this. Um, but we'd like to hear your thoughts. So in the so, chat, uh, Alejandro writes reliability is very important. <clears throat> Excuse me. And on the last question that uh, Kiri uh, put a comment in, I'll just put it in before we move on that most families who rent and cannot afford to buy homes uh, should be eligible to receive low cost service. So thank you. We'll, we'll note that. Okay. Um, so. Maybe I can move on to um, the uh, the seventh question, um, which is, um, you know, as a community tech member, I know many of you are wearing multiple hats here tonight. Um, you know, what would be your um, your um, thoughts around types of infrastructure access that you envision will be required to deliver this initiative? 
um, what constraints, challenges, and risks might arise that you want us to know about, um, and what immediate actions, um, ongoing support, as well as policy decisions from the city would be required or helpful for implementing um, or expanding the, the broadband network from your perspective. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any. Okay. Sorry, oh. Alice. Sorry. Uh, one hand just went up uh, late to the mark. Uh, so, Ike has a comment. Go ahead, Ike. Thanks. Uh, apologies for my kids in the background. Um, so, in, oh, yeah. for, oh, question, for question two, um, uh, uh, infrastructure. So we're we're bringing uh, the internet to uh, mm -hmm. residents of the city, um, but I I feel like there, how it gets into homes, uh, whether that's through a wireless system, um, the the infrastructure within like buildings, uh, for example, um, like older wiring cabling, uh, or even just <laughs> signals being able to pass through. Uh, um, different uh, construction materials. Um, it, it's one thing to say that we will bring it there, but I think when it gets to the location, there will be some significant challenges in terms of how it will uh, reach people consistently. Um, so th that is one thing. I'm sure you're already looking into that, but th that's just one thing that I thought was worth mentioning here. Awesome. Thank you, Aki. Um, Sylvia has said that she'd like to take some time to think about this one, um, uh, and that she's she's this is music to my ears, which is that she will fill it out in the link. Uh, I'd like to just encourage everyone to consider filling out the survey <laughs> as it comes up tomorrow. It'll be up for two weeks. Uh, tell your friends, tell everybody. <laughs> we want to hear from everyone on on their thoughts on this. So um, please, uh, please, if you have the time, um, take you know fill out the survey, and it would really help us um, hear your hear your thoughts. Uh, Rama has uh, their hand raised, um, but but I'm going to suggest we move on to the eighth question. And Rama, keep your hand raised, and then um, you can be the first to uh, speak after this question has been asked. Okay, so our last question of the evening. Thank you so much for for your patience so far. Is one of the directives we've been given is you know looking at um, the desirability, feasibility, and sustainability of of different business models for municipal broadband delivery. Um, it goes on to say, including but not limited to cooperatives, nonprofits, joint ventures, or public private partnerships. Um, it gives us the ability to issue any solicitations as desired. So um, I want to pose this uh, to the group around the um, the sort of the, the business model for the broadband network in general um, and invite you to 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 have that to to give you your, your thoughts maybe I'm sorry Rama is first. Uh, okay, uh, first thing I wanted to say in response to the question you had before uh, the first question, I think fiber optics nowadays in the world is probably the most advanced. So I think the infrastructure should focus on fiber optics and higher speeds. And I believe that uh, speeds less than 50 megabyte per second for download and 10 megabyte per second for upload is not acceptable. I mean, right now in community housing, they have very low speeds. So I think people expect higher speeds nowadays. Thank you. Absolutely, that's noted in our um... In our research with Ryerson University, we did a survey with 2,500 people in Toronto, and we found 
38% of them did not have the 5010 speed, which was uh, quite a high percentage. So I take your point, even at that speed, it's, we're not even, you know, there is definitely a digital divide in Toronto, um, but I take your point about the, the speed not being enough. And of course, we're also thinking about the sustainability of this program, wanting it to be, you know, um, you know, uh, sufficient for not just for today, but for the future. We have a few comments uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, Judy mentions that ads are predatory. Um, Ruth suggests consulting the network of the existing companies. And there's a thought around joint ventures as uh, not being, um, as being, it's as skeptical of private uh, public partnerships as it is. So not like a venture capitalist arrangement. So Ryan, we can chat more about this um, as well, but we, what we mean by joint ventures is, um, is not a, a venture capitalist um, um, a situation, like uh, um, program. So it's, it's something that we've done with, um, for example, um, other sort of utility sort of assets. Um, so Rama has his hand raised. So Rama, you can go ahead and ask your question. Oh, oh I forgot to uh, lower my oh. hand. So okay, my apologies. Okay. All right. So um, there's no more raised hands. Um, Alice, so back over to you. Yeah. Did yeah. Thanks. Oh, Thank you, Hamish. Wait. Sorry, one oh, just came hand. in. It's cool. Call and use of 416665. Go ahead. Oh. Since you can hey, go ahead and speak. So, um, how many trial buildings are we looking at for phase one? Like the city is going to bring fiber to a building to make this happen, correct? So, how many buildings are you thinking? Obviously, you haven't decided, but in general terms, how much? So we, we don't have any specific numbers. It also depends on how the negotiable RFP um, turns out, right? Um, but in, in the idea is it's not going to be, when we talk about the neighborhood, it's not going to be the entire neighborhood as defined, um, you know, in the planning sense of neighborhoods. So it's going to be a specific area, um, maybe a, a block or a, a cluster of buildings for each of the um, three to four sites. Great, thanks, Alice. Great. I don't see any more hands either. I don't see any more comments on the um, on the chat. Um, does, I, we have one minute left, so <laughs> I wonder if anybody have any other last thoughts they want to put into the chat. Um, we'd love to to hear from you. Um, I also just want to, um, you know, one more time, <laughs> um, invite you to visit our webpage. Invite you to um, email us, um, as well as, um, um, you know, fill out the survey uh, on your own time, or uh, encourage others who may be interested, or who may have, a, you know, some thoughts on this to to fill it out themselves. For those on the phone who have called in, um, thank you for calling in. Um, you can't see the website. Uh, you can email us at digitalfeedback at toronto.ca and we can send you that link. That's digitalfeedback at toronto.ca. Thanks, Hamish. Um, I just want to quickly personally thank everybody for taking their time. It's really nice to connect with you. And I'll hand it over to, to Lawrence, our, our Chief uh, Technology Officer. Oh, thank you very much, Alice. And uh, thank you everyone for participating. Um, it's been great to listen to the feedback and have your engagement. Also to thank all my colleagues um, who have invested a lot of time to make this happen. Thank you so much and, and, and working so diligently. So. Your, your feedback in terms of the public is so important to helping inform us. And um, I hope that through here, um, we'll continue to receive your uh, feedback 
um, through the um, email site that, uh, that Alice has mentioned. So with that, um, have a good evening and uh, hope everybody uh, enjoys the uh, wonderful weather that's outside. Thank you.